Perfect. Hello there. Welcome to another Camera Pro on the Couch, proudly supported by Canon Australia. So before we get started, if uh, anyone has any questions they wanted to pop in the chat, uh, feel, please feel free to share at any time. Me and Julie will try and get to it for you, okay? Perfect. Now, I can assure you tonight's guest uh, won't be an easy pack, act to follow. In a spare time, if she's not uh, chilling 20 metres underwater on a single breath, dodging lions, or uh, running on the bottom of the water with a, with a, a ship's anchor in her hands, it's uh, Julia Willer. Thanks for joining us, Julia. Thanks for having me. Uh, that's okay. Um, now, quickly, um, we, didn't, we, we talked a little bit about on Saturday what you would regard yourself uh, as a conservationist, filmmaker, doc documentary, and photographer. What, uh, what role do you like best? What, what hat do you like to wear? Um, I really love being the photographer. I love photographing people, animals, mm -hmm. um, everything, but I also love directing as well. So I guess that comes hand in hand. And, and just briefly before we, uh, we get into it, um, you've just come back from Shark Week, which is obviously very exciting. Can you uh, share a little bit about what you were doing? Um, I think it's due to release very soon, if it hasn't already. Yeah, um, so I was working with Discovery Networks um, this year in March and we filmed uh, one of the feature shows for Shark Week, which was called mm -hmm. Monster Mako Under the Rig. And yep. it was incredible. I got to I got flown over to the United States and I worked with an epic production team on a, a really big feature about um, Mako yep. sharks. So we got to go to, um, we were basically floating around in the, the Gulf of Mexico, um, which is surrounded by 4,000 or over 4,000 abandoned oil rigs. And under those rigs live a specific type of shark amongst many others, like um, yes. they were hammerheads and um, tiger sharks and well, the mako. And it was incredible. We had spinner sharks. So it was, it was yeah, shark playground. So we... You know, I had the incredible opportunity of working with these amazing people, amazing conservationists, amazing, um, my amazing co-host, Paul DeGelder, who I made the podcast with. Um, I got to work with Paul, which was really cool. And we were helping scientists um, gather genetic data of mako sharks to help them track the the patterns of where these um, apex predators were swimming to. So, yeah, it was really cool. And that aired last week. And... I'm looking forward to working with Discovery um, and Warner Brothers a lot more. So, yeah. Very, very cool. And mm. your your role on the team, um, Julia, was it just to was it sw swim and gather data mainly, or? Yeah. So my my role was to I was on camera with Paul, and mm. we were in a sense part of the team in the expedition, mm. which was going into the Gulf of Mexico to um, get to get genetic data from uh, or genetic samples, sorry, from uh, Mexico sharks to give yep. to the scientists. So we're really there to help um, the scientists collect the data that they need. Um, which helps them assist in in their research and then informing mm. us or you know, the, the humanity, like what's happening with, with that specific species. So I was there For to sure. free dive and also I was there scuba diving as well. And I used a full face mask, you know, the, the full face, the ones yeah, where you yeah, can yeah. The, three, the 360 sort of one. Yeah, I used that for the yeah. first time and it was, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty, like nerve-wracking in the beginning because mm, I literally had yeah, 10 minutes sure. to put this mask on and um, start talking underwater, which I've never really done before. So, yeah, yeah wow. it was really amazing. Yeah. And and was that was that more so free diving or was that um, with a tank that, for that one? That was with a tank for that one. Tank. Okay. Yeah. That's, I'd, I'd consider that probably the only way you'd be able to still be able to talk underwater as well. Yeah. 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 Um, now, why Mako sharks? Well, do they hold um, some keys in the answer to um, like other species in general or just more so sharks? I think that was just what they wanted to shoot. That was the episode mm. they wanted to shoot. And they were working with um, hammerheads. They were working with tiger sharks. They were doing lots of specials on different types of sharks. And I guess I landed the 
the episode that had the Mako shark. Yeah, very cool. And now they're, yeah. I think they're one of the fastest sharks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. epic. That's, that's, the, that's a little bit about Makos that I know. Um, and now, quick, just touching on that, um, take, take us back, Julia, to how it all started for you. So after doing a bit of reading and, and learning a little bit about you, um, it started from an early age. Um, from what I've been able to uh, acquire around seven years old is when you first noticed you, you're into photography in general. Um, was it more the exploration side of things that allows you to, to go somewhere different and capture amazing images? What, how, how did the love start? I think um, growing up in, in West Australia, I, you know, I was really lucky to have an incredible backyard and mm. the backyard was, you know, incredible, just mind blowing mm. nature. You know, I yeah. had the, I had the red earth, the desert, I had the, the ocean and I had the, the green trees, like green forests at like the Cary Valley down in, um, in Pemberton, just down below Margaret river. So I, was always going away on family holidays with my dad who is just the biggest explorer, the biggest go-getter that I've Mm. ever met in my life. Like my dad is still like, I've never met anyone who kind of exceeds um, his kind of drive. Oh, apart from Mm. probably my partner. I shouldn't, my, my partner is also incredible. Um, And so anyway, yeah, my, my dad would just take us out on these road trips and we'd go camping and we'd sleep in swags and we would go and stay in holiday houses. But no matter wherever we went, we were always just immersed in, in, in nature. And my dad kind of drove that into us, um, being my sister and I about the importance of, of being outdoors and getting out Mm. of bed in the morning and going to the beach and just kind of always being outside. So, um, I guess having that, having a dad like that, and having him having his drive like he does, is something yeah. that I guess wraps up on me. And yeah, that's that's where it all began. So, and then that's of course my dad. Loved, yeah, sorry, my, my dad loved photographing <laughs> things, which is probably the most one of the most important things. Um, dad mm. always had a always had a camera, so I guess I became curious about his camera, and it was a little Canon and. Yeah, from then on, that's how everything kind of started. Tr- triggered the love. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, s- starting out now, s- your love for swimming in the water as well. Did that come yeah. about from swimming lessons as such? Where, where, did, where did that passion come from as well? I guess I was forced to go to swimming lessons. Same. I can, I can preach that, me and my sister. We used to hide. We used to hide under the bed when Mum was asking for us to go to swimming. Yeah, like oh, it was so bad. I just remember the black line in the centre mm-hmm. of the pool, like on the left. Yep. So, yep. yeah, you hearing me? <laughs> so, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Being forced to learn how to swim. Um, my grandmother threw me in the pool when I was a baby. Like I, I had mm. to kind of for my life as a little baby in the pool and I was swimming for my life <laughs> before I was crawling um, yeah. and yeah I guess that started there and then my dad um, yeah just pretty much forced me to do swimming lessons and then I kept swimming and joined the, the school squad and then um, I ended up swimming to Rottnest Island um, which is the little island off the coast of Perth which is Epic. 22 kilometers. Yeah. so I swam 20 in, nice. o- in open, yeah, open ocean um, to Rotto. And, you know, I remember one of my first, one of my first memories of, of deep water was swimming through a patch in the ocean. Mm. And it was, it was so clear. I could see the ground, oh, the sand. And I felt like I was, I remember doing freestyle and I just felt like I was flying. Um, and it was a little bit scary. Mm-hmm. And then I had a shadow in my mask which was actually a shadow in my mask I thought it was a shark so it made me swim faster and yeah anyway I was forced and no. then I kept doing it. yeah <laughs> no so. that's that's I can I can relate as well so I did I did nippers um pretty early on as well yeah. um yeah. and we used to have to swim out to the boys that's one of the activities that you have to do and that's like anywhere near the shark nets I was always like I don't like as a kid I didn't want to go out there because you're instantly thinking like as soon as you're in deep water you're like yeah 
there's definitely a shark underneath me. No matter like, no matter if it's got shark nets or, or whatever else, like you always, you've got that fear in the back of your mind. I guess, yeah. is that something, is that something you have? Like, is that, you ever cautious about there being sea life out there and were you ever afraid early on? Yeah, you're going to laugh at me. Um, when I went, so this is, this is so crazy. When I was a kid, you literally just rem- reminded me of something. When I was a Forget kid. Forget a cool memory. Yeah, there was, no, you have. There was a, at my school, there was a 50 meter swimming pool and the deep end was really deep, but you, and it kind of, it went, you know, down. So you'd be at the shallower end of the pool and you'd look down towards the deep end but you couldn't see the floor because it was just this big sinking thing and I always thought there was this massive octopus that was going to eat me (laughs) and down the bottom of the swimming pool and so I'd kind of like I had to that's why I started I guess I started diving down when I got to the deep Mm. end creep over and look at it but that's yeah just out of of curiosity just to make sure there is nothing there as well so I guess that's kind of trained you a little bit to explore your space so you are comfortable in your surroundings i was terrified i was yeah i I was just terrified and traumatized of this octopus and then i started thinking okay i need to just be friends with the deep end and i guess that was that mate that probably played a part in why i held my breath just to kind of yeah there you go fear of the octopus (laughs) yeah so the octopus can't beat you no way um now Starting starting out as well, I, I have read a couple of articles on you um, and holding your breath was something that, that did come up a lot. Now, holding your breath in the bath, what sort of, what sort of ages are we talking here? Um, pretty, pretty young, I think. Yeah, quite young. Because um... are you a parent's worst nightmare when it comes to that stuff? Like, oh, where's Julia? She's holding her breath again. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if they know that I did it. I think I just. Yeah, right. I, those memories kind of come from um, liking. I, I loved to hear the muffled sound when you go underwater in a bath, and mm. you know, that, it, it's kind of it's muffly. And I think I was very um, intrigued by that sound, which again yep. is, is another reason why I went to to holding my breath in the bath it wasn't necessarily how long can I stay underwater it was the the fact that that there was something that was clinging on to my curiosity that kept Mm. me there um so that's I guess you know why I I was holding my breath and I don't I don't think my parents knew that I was doing it maybe they did um I went underwater a lot so they probably did know (laughs) um but I wouldn't you know I'd I'm up a lot so how, how did you how did your swimming teacher go like did, did they notice that you were duck diving a lot going under a lot or was that still part of I guess holding it together and, and pretending it was just you're still swimming along no I, I think I, I was probably my swimming coach's worst nightmare um yeah I did I, I didn't like to listen and to you know you know when you they make you put your arms on the side of the pool and then you have to yep. kind of do these ones blow bubbles and turn your head? The one, ar- the one arm with the the um, you got your your, your paddle board and you just go in the yeah. one arm. Yeah, hundred oh, percent. I, I hated the water going in my ears. <laughs> like I would turn my head and then you get all the water in your ears and I would I don't I would just hate it so much. So I would usually just go into water and swim off or I'd do anything to avoid t- tilting my head and getting that horrible sensation in my ears so yeah I, I, I didn't like swimming school I didn't like swimming lessons yeah. but I kept it up because I was forced to do it and um I'm very grateful that I was forced to do it mm. so, yeah, it's one of those, friends- like, <laughs> yeah it's one it's one of those iconic Australian things like I feel like yeah. everyone hates going to swimming like swimming lessons like especially early on it's just like you kind of do it like it's one of those first things you do because like pool safety it's very important but yeah. at the time, you're like, no, nah, nothing could be worse than this. Yeah, and the smell of the chlorine. Anyway, yeah, so anytime I got to go to the beach, that was awesome. I didn't do nippers like you. My sisters, yep. um, my brother did nippers. But um, my dad was literally nippers 101, I think, for me. Yeah, right. Let's go straight to the beach in the morning before school. Like, 
I was, I was, I'm, I'm the oldest as well, so I kind of copped it. Uh, okay. In, in terms of, you know, yeah. you're, the, you're, you're, you're the, uh, you're the guinea pig. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Cool. Um, well, it obviously, it obviously paid off, as, as we know, um, later in your career. Now, did how, how many siblings did you have, Julia? Um, I have two sisters and one brother. Yep. Okay. And are they all sort of around the same age? They are 31. Hang on. Hold on. No, 32. Yep. One of them is 32. One of them is, I think, like 21 and then 16. So my dad um, remarried. So there's, I have my full sister and then I have a brother and a half brother and yep. sister. Um, so yeah, that's, is that, that's my, is that, in was there a look in WA? Yeah. yeah. So you obviously started in Perth. Um, you, after school, you went to do a, a bachelor's degree. So you did a bachelor's degree. Tell us a bit about that and why you went that direction, I guess, after, after schooling. So, um, yeah, after school, I, well, I lived in China and Singapore for a year okay. and then I went to, so yeah, then I went to Sydney and I, I kind of always liked the media side of, of the world and mm -hmm. being creative, taking photos. And, um, so I kind of explored that a little more and then I think I was 19 and, you know, I hadn't gone to university and, you know, everybody was supposed to go mm -hmm. to university you're supposed yep. to go to university and do all this stuff when you finish school, which is just, I think For that's sure. ridiculous. Um, yep. You just shouldn't go to university when you finish school. You should like explore. Um, I'm sensing but, a um, pattern of, of not going, following lines here. There's no, there's no, no lines to Julia. No, no, that's true. Oh, okay. And I don't, I don't do it, you know, because I want to break rules or not follow mm. lines. I do it because I think that we all, are capable of making our own choices and following our own gut feelings and our own ambitions. And that's that there's no rule book that you follow to do that. No, you just kind of absolutely do it. not. <laughs> so, and, and um, keep going. Sorry. No, no, you go. Um, was photography something that you were just doing as a hobby at that stage? Like, it, or did you think that, wait on a second? I could do something out of this or does that develop a little bit later? Well, in, in short, so in a, in a short, um, to condense all my t the timeline of, of when photography kind of ca became mm -hmm. like my, my focus, I, you know, cause I was always kind of told in a way, you know, you, you, you're not going to make any money um, mm. being creative and blah, blah, blah. The usual thing that some people yep. have to say, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not driven by money. Like I was never driven by net, like to be, you know, if I was driven by money, I would have been a banker or, you know, someone that's very orientated, but I'm, I'm very much not driven by cash. So, yeah. <laughs> which can also be, you know, a downfall, but at the same time, I mean, you just happiness and, and what you love, you should do what you love and make it work. But anyway, going off, off par there, going back to what I was saying is that I went to NIDA, so I went to the National Institute yep. of Dramatic Art, and I did mm -hmm. television there. And then yep. I did a diploma in journalism, followed by a double major in media and communications. But I majored in like cultural studies and philosophy and started to look at philosophers like Edward de Bono, who's my favorite philosopher. He um, right. originated lateral thinking, so thinking outside the box. And then I guess I just, everything kind of started ticking a little bit more. And then I, I learned a lot about, you know, the, the media, the world, the media world and like governmentality and mm. um, the way that things are perceived to target um, humans. And, and yeah. I found that super fascinating. And I finished, so I did four years, five years of study. And then I was going to actually do, I, I got into Bond University on the Gold Coast uh, for psychology. Uh, I was going to be a criminal psychologist. <laughs> and wow. two days before I was supposed to go and start that degree, I sold everything in my apartment um, to a friend and I got a one-way ticket to Thailand and I jumped back into the water. And I, I just needed to go. I'd done five years of hardcore study, media, yep. like, you know, living in a city um, 
after growing up in West Australia in, in yep. you know, the most remote place in the world to like city yep. life to bang, bang, bang. And I had worked my absolute butt off to pay for my degrees. I was working three jobs mm. and I just wanted to go back to me. So yep. I went and what was calling was literally an, uh, like this island like called Koh mm. Tao in the middle of, you know, in the Gulf of Thailand. And I went to Koh Tao and that's where I did my dive master and um, started free diving. And during my dive master, after I finished that, I actually, I worked with an underwater photographer, a videographer, and I started filming underwater and that was like mm. 10 12 years ago and so I was doing all of the the films the underwater filming for the dive masters that had all, all the divers the tourists that wanted their their tourism videos so okay. I was frothing like it was so cool we had like so many that and I started diving with bull sharks at that time because we had some bull sharks um out, out at one of the dive sites so I, you know, was surrounded by these really awesome tourists and then their first experience with sharks and I had an epic underwater setup and I was kind of there doing all of this, which I loved. And then from there, I kind of just went and worked on boats in Europe <laughs> and then I came back to Australia and got a, a real job. Uh, I worked yep. in a photography studio. A photography was- studio, yep. Yeah, I was the business development manager at a photography studio and okay. um, I found all what, the equipment. What age are we talking at this stage, Julie? 25. 25, cool. Yeah, so I was working as a BDM and then I found all the, the photography equipment and started shooting in studio and the retoucher mm. and I became good friends, um, James McDonald, and he was really bored because he was deep etching like heaps of stuff and you know, doing all these like really boring kind of studio shoots. So him and I would stay at the studio behind hours and start doing our own shoots and he would retouch my work and I, and he would show me how to use all of the photography equipment by watching the photographers who were shooting before we would go in. Um, Then I quit that job, sold my car and bought my first can, like my first real camera, which was my Mm. Canon 5D Mark II. And I and a 50 mil lens and I got a one-way ticket to Spain and I walked across the country. Amazing. Amazing. And now, uh, obviously, you were talking about the philosophy um, and behind what you do and, and listening to yourself. What's promoting, at this age, what's promoting all these massive changes to your life? What, what is it, a gravitational pull? How, how does someone, I guess, tap into that? Tap into... Where, like where I'm walking in my life. Yeah, finding a finding a calling uh, at an entirely different location. I, I'm because that's scary I'm, for most people, right? Like most people are, are absolutely scared of, of of sometimes even leaving home. Yeah, I think I've always listened to my intuition, and I've always trusted mm. myself. I've always trusted my gut feeling and I think it came from you know it probably came from being really young at school um growing up and I was really really severely and horrifically teased and bullied and I Mm. think I had I had to um I was like a massive loner at school and I was always always out in you know the garden and I was always by myself like or playing with animals or whatever you know I was just Mm. a different I couldn't really relate to most people and I think I just, with growing up and having so much doubt around me, I knew that I I had to learn to, um, I went through some really difficult times as a kid, like especially a teenager, Mm. Mm. went through some horrific stuff and Mm. I think that just made me, I, I I ultimately had a choice of, you know, I've got to kind of really grab the bull by the horns and, and, and yep. live the life that I want to live or there's no point, like, you know, I don't want to be miserable. So mm. I think coming, like, going back, back to that, that made me back myself and then mm. also growing up and being in other situations where there was a lot of doubt. I had to continuously learn to back myself and my own decisions and remember that it's my it's my life and... Yep. 
if I want to go outside and explore or if I don't want to go to university right now or ever or if, you know, there's things that a path that I want to follow that I want to take, then I can I sh- I can do that. It's my choice. Mm. It's no one mm. else's choice. So yeah. I think that's, I don't know if that answers your question. No, definitely. That's I think that's that's really beautiful of you to say. Obviously, it's a deeply personal experience, but I guess any any way you can put it that makes sense to you is is fair enough. Um, would you have any, Would you have any advice to anyone else? I guess maybe any listeners at home, maybe in their mid twenties, kind of a bit lost on what they want to do, I guess, and, and maybe life's told them one thing and they're, they're thinking another. What what advice would you give to someone? Um, I think if we're talking about anyone in their 20s, you have got so much time to go and do whatever you want to do and you should go mm. and do it right now. Um, yeah. And if that means quitting your job and going overseas and using your savings or half of your savings or some of your savings or maybe you don't even mm. have any money, just mm. go and get a job or change your environment. Um, but I think that it's always important to remember that if you do do that and you do change your environment, um, just back, back yourself and know that you made that choice independently and no one made it for you. And, yeah, just go, like, really listen to that calling. Like maybe you wanted to be a vet when you were a kid or you wanted to be a, a, an astrophysicist. Like there's no, there's no time like the present to – to follow your your dream and 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 kind mm. of go and make it happen because they can happen but you have to work really hard and be prepared to make those choices to continue yeah. to work hard and you'll get there so that's probably what i'd say absolutely <laughs> no that's really good that's really good um any where in, intensely made you pick places like thailand places like spain what was what was i guess the the calling there um, Thailand, I picked Thailand because I spoke to my friend Giles on the phone a couple of days before I went and he said to me, you should just go to an island somewhere and chill out and have fun yeah. and be young and be free and not go to university again. Like you don't need to like go and sort, go and sort out what you want to do rather than yeah. what everyone thinks that you need to do. So, um, I just always wanted to go to Thailand and I don't know, I guess I just picked that one. But as for Spain, that was completely intuitive. I Mm. just had this feeling that I needed to go to Madrid. So I just went, I'd always wanted to go to Spain like Mm. for years. And I think I just thought, all right, it's Madrid. Like there was, it was calling me. to go to Madrid so I did and then two days after I landed I met a guy in a bar who told me that he just walked the Camino de Santiago which is the pilgrimage across Spain so I went straight to France and started the walk across Spain and then my journey kind of continued from then on Um, and then I guess other places around the world that I've been like Africa I've since I was like tiny I always wanted to go to Africa and I've got a strong connection with that place. So yeah, yeah, it's intuition and just general curiosity, I think. And and at this stage, cameras, cameras coming along with you everywhere. Is that something you sort of just take with you as well? Yeah. I mean, I don't go anywhere without my camera, my Canon camera. Yeah. um, Uh, and, And, and touching on a bit about your, uh, Africa trip um, obviously some really special moments there as well and we'll probably get into showing some photos a little bit later um, mm-hmm. what about conservation really inspires you what uh, what obviously it, it's a huge passion of yours how did that come about I think I just I just always loved animals yeah. and I always loved the thought of being able to kind of bring justice to people that or people or mm. things animals that couldn't speak for themselves yep. because I always found it you know it was hard for me when I was growing up I didn't have anyone to kind of speak up for me or speak mm. up for how I was feeling or, or, or protect yep. me and, such. and I think that just was something that 
just was really deeply ingrained in in who I am as a person mm. having that that passion and that want and again that in that it's just a feeling like that's what I have to do that's why I'm here um yeah. I have to kind of help help those that don't have a voice and that can't speak and that I guess comes down to conservation it comes down to animals it comes down to protecting areas with just the most incredible biodiversity and habitats that the planet has so yeah I don't know I don't know it just it was always in me like when I probably when I was born it was there I've never not known anything other than wanting to work with wildlife and with with just everything around wildlife so yeah yeah that's that's, that's, (laughs) and, and and obviously it's not like it doesn't always go to plan have you have you had been in any situations where it hasn't quite gone to plan or you've been in some scary scary spots um i think oh there's that yeah there's been quite a lot of scary spots um like heaps i think one of the more quirkier things Mm -hmm. that ever happened to me was i was in africa in like 2000 and 2017 or 2019 I'm not sure which one but I was working with a vet um Dr Pete Rogers and we we got a call um that there was a hippopotamus in a swimming pool at a game reserve in Hootsbright which is um a town in South Africa and we had to go to this um luxurious you know African tented like hotel you know just the luxe of the luxe um hotel and we got there and all of the workers and everyone was just hiding they were all like I just remember them like hiding kind of in the kitchen and behind walls and in the middle of this it was literally like a 10 meter swimming pool 10 15 meter swimming pool it was small but there was the whole swimming pool was full of a hippopotamus yeah so there's New wow. hippo had just decided to kind of go for a walk into the swimming pool and it was it was even eating like all of the sandbags that the workers were throwing <laughs> in to try and get the hippo out. Um, and yes. then, the, yeah, Pete Rogers, he, he actually, you know, he couldn't dart it. We couldn't, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't, you know, make it go to sleep because it would drown. So we had to yes. fill up filling up this swimming pool with with sandbags um anyway the hippopotamus had just crawled out that it ate half of the sandbags but that was weird you know but fun like not weird it was is sand is sand a bad diet for a hippopotamus what 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 does sand do anything not great yeah no not great not great at all um (laughs) no so yeah well he he, i mean we're trying to help him but if he wanted Mm. to eat everything then what are you going to do um and then there was another time then there was a um there was another time that we had a a really um a really angry lion that had an injury and we had to go and check on this lion um in in the reserve and yeah. the lion had been put into a boma which is a holding a, like a holding caged area where yeah. you put a, a wounded or an injured animal um for them to recover and the lion to- his name was tofu he'd jumped out of the boma right, and he'd gone, yeah he'd gone Strong wandering man. tofu yeah <laughs> tofu he'd gone wandering not, it wasn't a vegan lion obviously no <laughs> <laughs> well i wish he was by the time yeah, i got exactly. to yeah he was wandering around and we had to we had to go find him and check that he was okay wow. um because of, because of the magnitude of his injury and so we tracked him. Um, he had a, a satellite, like a, he had a collar on. So we could, we could, we knew where he was, but we couldn't get to him on the, in the vehicle. We had to go on foot. So I yeah, had. Just, a, just casually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. Like we, we just, we had to kind of go find the lion in, in, in the bush. <laughs> um, what, what have you got a, as protection at this stage? Like, is there anything that can protect you or is it too late at that point? Well, that's one of the things you've kind of got to um, be okay with is that mm. like you can, you can go, you can go into the bush. Like even when I'm working, like if I'm in the, like in Gabon in West Africa, you know, we're working with forest elephants and I've worked, I've been, I've been three meters away from like Western lowland gorillas as well in the wild. Oh, wow. And I've been like, I've, 
worked with heaps of vets with rhinos, like when we, you know, put them under to, to remove their horn so that they, you know, mm. that they would be the poachers. So the I've always, poachers, I'm always yeah. yeah, I'm always really, really close to big dangerous animals and like with, mm. with sharks. And I guess that's a risk that you know you're taking. Um so you kind of know that I'm going that you could you know, something could happen to you. <laughs> so mm, you kind of mm. got to have, you have to kind of be um, okay with that. And I guess that was part of going to find tofu. It's like, okay, lion can eat me if it wanted to, but yeah. I'm just going to try that. I'm just going to trust everything's going to be okay. So I'm, I'm there. I've got a, a guide in front of me and he's got a rifle. Um, the rifle um, wasn't loaded. I don't think, uh, I don't think it was, or maybe it was. I don't know. I can't remember, but I don't. I don't know if it, maybe it was, and then he didn't load it. I don't know. Anyway, so we. I have. I had a guy in front of me, or the ranger, and we went. And we went to find him. And we, as we came closer to him, he he growled. And when a lion growls, like a two hundred and fifty kilo lion growls, and you can you can't see him and you can hear him, you really know what it's like to. You know what it feels like to be hunted. Mm. Mm. so you your everything changes like your, yeah. your your kind of your heart rate kind of obviously goes up a bit um your hair's standing up at the back of your neck yeah frozen probably yeah and you these these senses like it's almost like you've got these these as humans we probably have these <laughs> these senses that come out and they're like get out of there yeah <laughs> you know literally like, fight or flight like, yeah 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 fight or flight exactly so um but you know we've got to go find him, and we can't see mm. him, so we've got to get visual. Mm. So we keep going, and we know which direction he's coming from, and we kind of we we semicircled around him until we could get a visual. And um, yeah, he charged us, and yes. my guy, like my ranger, he just held up the rifle and yelled, like screamed, like really loud, like yeah. almost like a standoff because yeah. you can't you can't you don't want to shoot it you don't want to shoot the lion nobody no. wants to shoot a lion ever no. um so the only way you know that you can kind of fend fend them off is is yelling and and kind of showing that um holding holding or standing your ground really so that's what happened and he kind of i just remember when he was running towards us and it was really it was incredible but it was also mm. terrifying but it was all those things that I feel like in life we live for. There, there are these moments that, you know, make you feel not... alive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. that I was trying to. Not that I was no, trying to. Like... No, I was trying to get that right. <laughs> no, it's kind of incidental. Uh, yeah, and that's really, that's really cool. There's like comfort living, and then there's yeah, really living those moments that do make you feel alive, and that those moments are yeah, working with animals and being in in the real, like living in those real, like real, living in the real world, I guess, yeah, because sure. for me, this, this is all padded and, you know, cozy and yeah, like I'm exactly. in my van <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's, it's lovely and beautiful. Um, but when you, you know, when you really, when you really want to live, I think, or when you want to know what living really is, I think it's definitely finding those moments that, that aren't day to day. And that's what I, I like to live for. So yeah. I love it. I love it. And obviously the proof's in the pudding. If you don't challenge yourself, you don't grow, right? So if you're if you're constantly putting yourselves in these real world situations, you know, that's giving you real, real world opportunities at the end of the day and, and, and your life is a, a good result of that, I think. It's cool. It's good. It's yeah. been a, it's 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 hard work, like you know, it's it's pretty hardcore. Um yeah, that, that was another thing I was going to ask as well. Obviously, how do, how do you deal, you know, with uh, getting your body able to wake up every day, still have that same level of inspiration? Do you take, like, is downtime an option or is downtime, you know, the, the times that you are doing this kind of thing? Um, I, yeah, I don't, I guess downtime... <sighs> I don't really know. I, yeah, yes, I guess. I you don't have know my what downtime down is by the sound of it. No, I do. I do. I um, <laughs> I love, like, I love, like, I, I spend a lot of time, um, 
my downtime I kind of is kind of I guess my hobby is like the mm. like I co-founded a, a van company with my partner um my amazing yes. partner um called yeah called Yachi and you know we've got we we in our downtime we have we've got five Mercedes Sprinters um vans and we convert the vans into um to living living vans and working wow. remote working remote living and that's because yep. of what's happened over the last kind of couple of years mm. um remote working has become such a big thing and you know, sure. um also connecting connecting people back to to country back to the land yep. back to you know where we came from and mm. um inspiring people to um get out into nature and, and live in these vans so i guess there's a lot of downtime that happens here in those vans but it's also still work so i guess i incorporate working and living amongst it all i don't even know if i answer yeah. that question right. it's just a weird oh, yeah. like yeah so yeah that's good um, um now going back to the photography side of things um so when you were doing your free diving, it kind of started a little bit by accident um, from what I was reading, um, your first competition. Um, how yeah. did the photography get you into doing something else that you love, the free diving, such a thing? Like, because without one, you might have not found the other. Would that be correct in saying? Um, yeah, in a way, they kind of came in hand in hand. Um, mm. So when I was in Thailand the first time um, scuba diving and learning yep. how to film, I wouldn't have been learning how to film had I not been scuba diving. Um, so the, the the diving really, yeah, I guess it was the diving that mm. brought in the underwater um, photography and filming. And then with the free diving, I went to an event called One Breath Jamboree, which is, yep. was an international free diving um, meet yep. that used to happen once a year in our med in Bali. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I had the opportunity to just kind of, this was after Thailand. So I'd kind of, you know, just started really exploring free diving. And I think having yeah, the camera, sure. I had like a little Canon again, like just a little Canon camera. Um, and I was surrounded by these international free diving athletes and, you know, they were all in their elements at this meet. They were all training together, diving together. And I was just this, you know, full amateur underwater photographer mm. person that could barely even dive. Um, well, I mean, I could dive, but like not like really deep how they were going. But I was just yeah. every single dive that I, every single time I dived down and every single time, you know, I kind of looked at them in my, in my lens, it kept me underwater longer. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the, the free diving and the photography um, definitely helped me extend my breath hold for sure. Yeah. And just that general right. curiosity and fascination and just the wow factor of being underwater and seeing the, the magnitude of beauty that was around me, you know, these, these, these beautiful, you know, everything kind of happens slow motion underwater mm. when you're free diving and when you've got all the beautiful the bubbles coming up as well from scuba divers underneath you when you've got like a huge you know the u.s um liberty shipwreck right next to you and this it's a whole it's another it's literally another planet another world you're going to another world so you're okay. mixing the incredible free divers um everything that was happening underwater the fact that i had this camera to capture everything that was happening underwater mm. definitely push started to push me and then off the back of that, I did a bit of free diving training. And then yep. off the back of that, I think it was a couple of years later, I ended up back in Bali to photograph the Australian Depth Nationals. Um, that was in 2016 or 2017. Mm. And oh, I was the end of 2016. Um, and I I ended I went to the competition and, and to photograph it. And Julia, um, who runs Apnea Bali, who I'd known for years. She's amazing. She was like, hey, you need to compete because we don't have enough mm. athletes. Mm. So um, I signed up. I had two days to get ready and then the competition ended up being full and I came third, um, wow. which was really quite crazy. But, it, you know, I was only diving to like 30 metres. Like it wasn't mm. – it wasn't like I was going to where I ended up going 
later in like world championships and stuff like down to 50. So it was, I wasn't oh, wow. diving in order to come third. I didn't have to go, you know, it wasn't just like massively huge depth. Um, I just think I got lucky. And how, how, Julia, how does one know how far you can go down? This might sound um, like a silly question. <laughs> not at all. I guess you just have to, again, it comes down to trusting your body and trusting yourself and trusting the judgment that you have to keep yourself protected and keep yourself safe. Mm. So it's an escalation of, of over time of, of learning how your body changes underwater and your, the adaptations and, you know, how your heart, like just familiarizing your whole body with, with the new things that happen, like the blood yeah. shift and, yeah. um, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of different things that happen. And, and as you get deeper and deeper, every meter becomes a bigger challenge because when you're close on the surface, you know, 20 meters doesn't seem that far, but when you start hitting 50 meters, um, it, it's, you just, you really have to take your time. But I think free diving definitely teaches you how to, again, just back yourself and trust about yourself. Your body. Yeah. Yeah. I, re- I you- really like one. I really like one of the quotes that I, I read in an article that was done on you to be your own su- superhero. What, is, what does be your own superhero mean to you? Um, be your own superhero. So just be yourself because everyone's a superhero. Everyone has an internal superhero. You know, we're like all unique. It. We're all That's individual. Really and it's great to be individual. Like why would you want to be like anyone else? That's like super boring. <laughs> Like, just be you. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, now, what? I guess what tips would you give uh, someone starting out in underwater photography? What, I guess, are the main things someone would need to get involved in, in, in doing that? Maybe not to obviously free diving depths, but just, yeah. just basic underwater sort of stuff if they want to go on the next trip and want to experiment a little. What, would, what advice would you give them? Um. Well, it depends kind of how much you'd want to spend. Um, Mm. But at the same time, that doesn't really matter because if you just want to kind of learn and um, if you just want to do something basic, just grab one of those disposable underwater film cameras, which I still think is is super, super cool. Um, Yeah, they've come back. It's strong into popularity. Yeah, so grab one of those. Um, Or, you know, anything, anything Canon, like, grab I don't know Canon have lots of little cameras and then you can get the kind of the I think Icolite is a brand yes. that does um really like a lot like a cheaper version of underwater housings but you don't mm-hmm. you wouldn't go deep with those but then you can also go to like brands like Icol- uh, yeah Icolite and then there's Nordicant so I yep. Aquatech yep I have mm-hmm. um I have like a a Nordicam housing that I've used for yep. ages and that that's what I put my R5 in. But starting with people that want to start out, like I started out with like just a little very basic point and shoot um, mm. Canon camera with like a little Icolite housing. I, my setup was like not even a grand. I think it was around $700 or something. Yeah, sure. Um, and, yeah, just kind of getting used to it. I remember being on the Great Barrier Reef um, in the Bunker Group Islands with with it, and it was fine. And I think it's just about you know you don't need to spend all the all, every single bit of money that you have. Mm. Mm. Start small, but if you do want to spend a bunch of money, then spend it if you've got it. Um, if you're yeah. really going to do it, but again, I don't, I don't, yeah. I mean, just even, even something like the G, <laughs> like the G sevens or the G threes, the yeah. G ones. That was actually what I had. I had had the G9 or I think it was G9 or G10. Yeah. Um, That's what I had. That's what I think I Mm. was working with a long time ago. Uh, Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's great. And now I guess outside of the ocean now, stepping back into doing a bit more safari type stuff uh, to do a bit more wildlife um, on the land. What is mm-hmm. what's what's your current setup? What does uh, Julia's current setup look like? Um, I when I was shooting my series in Africa, I had mm-hmm. a one DX Mark II. I had a five D Mark IV. I had a five DS, 
And then I was also shooting on the Canon, the C300, which yep. was like insane. Um, so that was then. And now I still have all of those, the lenses. So I didn't, I haven't upgraded my lenses. I still use my same lenses that I had for those bodies. And I shoot on the R5 with an adapter um, just because again, like if you don't need to spend the money, I mean, Canon, Canon glass, Canon lenses, they're all incredible. Like, you mm. don't, if you don't need to upgrade, don't, but if you can yeah. then do it, <laughs> like, because have they're, you, have, amazing. You, have you found switching, I guess, so currently you're using some EF glass on an R5 system. Have you found yeah. uh, a big advantage to going from DSLR to mirrorless in a way? To be completely honest with you, when I first started using the R5, I was pretty, mm. I was kind of, I was pretty off it because I mm. had used, um, you know, the originals for so long. Like I hadn't used mirrorless before. I didn't, I didn't, it felt different. Like even the R5 camera body was different. It, it's lighter and it's, it's, a, it's a different, it was almost like a different culture of camera that I was, that I was holding when I went to the mm. R5. And, yeah. um, and then it took me probably like, three to four months to even like just to like it. And now yeah, sure. I would just, I would, it took probably like then another, like probably six months in total for me to really kind of get my head around it. And that's not shooting every day though. Like no. that's probably if we, if we condense that, we're probably looking at like four weeks of getting my head around it, not six months. That's just cause I wasn't, I wasn't shooting all the time, but um yeah, it was a, a, a slow kind of pro process to get mm. used to the R5 and, like, befriend it. But now, like, since I have and since I've used it, I would never, ever, ever use another camera, um, especially because of – what's that thing I was talking to you before we started the uh, the, the touch to touch the, the touch. shoot feature. Oh, yeah. man, like, yeah, that, that's a game changer, like, when you're out. And because a lot of the stuff I do is is a lot of – like, I do a lot of motion. Mm. Um I was a family photographer for a really long time and I used to work with, with a lot of a lot of children also with like yeah. animals, children and animals. And you've got these subjects that are always moving. So and also when I'm playing with light, because I don't use a flash, like I've I've never been into flash photography. So yeah. my my images are very much like heavily light manipulated. So if mm. I'm kind of looking down like on the screen as well and kind of looking at a subject or an area. And I kind of really, I want to shoot like really shallow and I want to focus on an area rather than focusing with the, with the button. Um, I can just touch the screen and it takes a photograph where I, and the focal point is where my finger touches. I don't know if yeah, I'm explaining nice. that very well. No, 100%. Um, just, yeah. The whole like touching the screen to take a picture and nailing, you know, not only like your focus, but incorporating, um, you know, all of the elements of light that you want yeah. and it, it's just it's it's a huge control um element that has been added to that camera that is it's just like it's honestly like the best thing obviously i can't use it underwater um but the the tracking is is, is super cool amazing um, yeah for sure so, and any yeah, specific love... any specific lenses that live on your camera like what I guess, is it something for convenience while you're underwater more so and then when you're on land you can be um, a bit more picky in your, in your choices? How does that usually work? Um, when I'm underwater, I like using the 16 to 35. Um, I really yep. love that lens. It just That'll gives me wider. like, yeah, I can be versatile. Like I can, sorry, I can be diverse in mm. um, in what I'm shooting. I don't, I don't like... 30 16 35 is good i mean but if i can just i i love fixed lenses i've always shown a fixed lenses so my favorite lens yeah. is 35 um yep, nice. absolutely love the 35 and then also the 14 i really love that for underwater as well if i'm shooting like photographing whales um or want to get really close to big subjects the 14 yep. is beautiful and you don't get that warped weird edge it's just like a really clean it's 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 a, it's a very complimentary um lens to use underwater um, yeah you're not you... dealing with distortion as well obviously because like no. especially underwater like you you kind of if anything's in the corner of the frame it's quite important as well so yeah, totally. So yeah. I love, yeah, 16, 35, 35 and 14. Um, and then like um, you can't really look past the 70 to 200 when you're shooting, you know, 
whether you zoom, telephoto, whatever. It's just absolutely it's the best. Yeah, if you want something that's kind of not too heavy, um, that will take a really clean, crisp image, um, then that's that's my other lens, my go-to. And then I've got a bunch of others. I don't really use a 24 to 70, I think, because yep. it, on the pure fact that it's a zoom and I don't love mm. them. But yep. That's just personal choice. But a lot of people love that lens. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like the portrait, um, 24 to 70 is kind of the, you know, the go-to, but I just like to get up in really close to people's faces with the 35. Yeah, um, that's, that's totally okay because at the end of the day, I think people do get caught up in, in lens choicing and camera choice, but at the end of the day, rem remembering it's the story that you're telling. It's about the person on the other side, you know, yeah. not getting too caught up in what gear, you know, and if you've got one lens that's a fixed lens, that kind of forces you to be in that situation as well, which is really nice. Yeah, and when I um when I went to Spain and sold my car and bought the five D Mark II, the the I literally bought the five D Mark II and a fifty mil lens, um and I ha I shot on that for like a year, um so I had to kind of you know I didn't have the cash to buy other lenses and I just wanted to keep traveling so I it was almost like a challenge like what can I shoot on this fifty mil lens and <laughs> I. So much. Um, it was, yeah. And then I got the 35 and then I stuck with the 35 forever. Um, so, yeah, I've gone through uh, like three 35s. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. All of that, that, that goes to show. And then I'm going to show you some of your images um, very shortly as well. Um, and then we can probably describe maybe what lenses and stylistic choices you chose when shooting uh, the imagery. Um, oh. One thing I think is important that you might have done pretty early on was the apnea course. So I guess for anyone that's doing or looking at yes. doing underwater photography, especially surf photography, uh, there are some pretty important safety tips. And, and I, I know you've addressed that um, on your podcast as well about going diving alone um, being a big no-no for you as well. Um, but also what importance would you put on like something like an apnea course for someone um, that's doing a bit of surf photography because at the end of the day, they, ha they teach you to relax and if, if you get any sticky situations, it's a really good tool, I think. Yeah, I think it's really important for anyone who's engaging with any form of water activity outside of um, swimming, like mm. that they should, they should do, or even, even swimmers actually, anyone that's, that's working in and around the water. Um, yeah, doing a free diving course, like a level one, stage one, Yep. Um, is all you really need. Like if you're not looking at kind of, you know, cool. hitting hitting depths past 10 metres, um, yep. I would advise that, yeah, you, you do a, a level one free diving course. And what that in, involves is a uh, two day, two day, uh, depends who you do it with, but it's either two mm -hmm. days or three days. So you can actually do it on a weekend. Like you start on a Friday afternoon and then Saturday and Sunday you, you, you do your course and by Sunday, Arvo, you're a certified level one free diver. Um, yep. That's usually done in a pool and then also out in the ocean so you can have some depth. Um, but it's a good course because it will, you know, teach you a lot about yourself, your body, mm. um, how your body works when you're diving. And, yeah, the main thing, again, is when when you are diving, like you, you should never dive alone, like yeah. ever because yeah. you can drown. You know, if your body – your body tells your brain that you're running out of oxygen because of certain pressures and what's going on around you. You, you can have, you know, you can be exposed to shallow water blackouts. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have a friend there, they can revive you quite, quite quickly opposed to sure. not being revived and, and obviously, you not know. Not having a chance at all. Yeah. So do a course for sure. And mm. um you may even want to go further and go deeper. And that's what's really exciting about freediving. It's about setting your own limits and setting your own boundaries and trusting your ability to to take you take you where you want to go. Yeah. No, that's a good call. That's a good call. Um now let's let's get in some imagery because you have amazing imagery and we want to to allocate some proper time to do the justice it deserves, but let's have let's have a look at some. I'm going to try and attempt to share my screen here, so <laughs> let's see how we go. <laughs> no um, all right, let's do this. Here we go entire screen. Let go there. All right. Yay. So, I think we're good. So let's start. 
I'm going to pop these up here full screen. So this is um, your Afro African conservation uh, trip, yep. I, I assume. Can you see the yeah, images so, okay? Yeah, I can. Yep. Um, Perfect. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of hard to make out, but that's an injury lima. So that's the last of the largest living lima that we have left, like the last yep. bit, um type of species we have left so um i photographed this beautiful injury in madagascar um and madagascar has like uh, approximately i think it's 111 species of lemurs and 95 percent wow. of them are on the brink of extinction um mm. so yeah the the madagascar what's happening in madagascar what's happening with the lemurs again this is the same lemur. Um, the reason that the vet is holding him is because we had to do a, a rescue mission and capture this lemur and its partner. Um, they are boreal, so that they live in the trees. And as you can see, all of the trees around him, most of them have been burnt down. Um, yeah. So we had to run through the the um, Malagasy um, forests and and use a blowgun to, to yeah. essentially dart these lemurs to relocate them to a, a safer environment. So this is yep. why we have to relocate them because there was no, there's almost no forest left where they were. Um, yeah. And then these so are forest I'm elephants. through too fast. <laughs> That's okay. There's just so much I want to talk about with know, these images because they mean so much. But um, yeah, these are, That's this is a photograph of forest elephants. So, this isn't a subspecies of the um, savanna elephant. It's just yep. a different species. Yep. So these guys are forest elephants. They live in the forests of Gabon in West Africa, and they're known as the the forest gardeners. So they wow. um, eat seeds and poo out really cute little trees that grow into big, beautiful trees. And, yeah, they support the mandrills and the gorillas. And, um, so they're very just... uh, obviously very important as well to conserve. Yeah. Yeah, there's only 45,000 left um, approximately. Um, they've all kind of just been axed and and poached for their tusks, um, which is which yeah. is incredibly sad. So, and yeah, those lions are um, lion. That these this is like horrible. I went to a lion breeding facility in South Africa. Yeah. Um, there's about 8,000 captive bred lions at the moment, and they're used for hunting, and they're basically used for commercial um, commercial gain, commercial profit. So lions like that are bred, put in really small enclosures, hunted, and then uh, mm. their bones are sold to the Asian markets for the bone trade. So, yeah, yeah, that was just one of my shots. I was using a 35. Oh, no, I was using a 16, 16, 35 for these yep. ones. Um, yep. yep, that's fine. And then you've got tusks there. So I went into an ivory vault as well, um, $12 million of, of, of horn, um, wow. which is that one there. It's really gross, like just awful, total graveyard. That that's a dead rhino. Um, and I'd just been poached probably like 20, 20 hours before I got there to that crime scene. And, wow. um, Oh, no, sorry. Sorry. No, that one wasn't poached. We actually had to euthanize that rhino because it had a huge bullet wound on its leg, um, mm. its right leg. And so that rhino was alive when we got there. Then we had to put it down because it was going to die. And that that's was terrible. really yeah. terrible. Traumatic. Yeah, but that's an everyday thing in Africa. There's some more lions that were going to be hunted. And, um, yep. <laughs> humans oh. um and then the next one is a, a rhino <laughs> beautiful rhino one of my portraits that i love um i actually can't wait to frame that and stick it on my wall um beautiful like, yeah beautiful. So, most... so that was that was the so more uh, some some great images obviously we're only sharing a very small minority of, of the stuff that you shot but that's um a bit more of your Afri african trip that you're on yeah, so that yep. was um, for building and shooting my series, um, which I spent seven years developing, and that's coming out soon. Um, we're just kind of finalising a few details. Um, and I, guess, I, assume, I assume with documentaries, uh, there's a lot of sign-off that has to happen. So something that you filmed years ago is, is you know, probably still pending in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, there always is. There always, the, you know 
there always is. So yeah, and this is um, oh, we're in the Amazon now. This is this is something that obviously when we touched on it before we started is is obviously very important to you. So this is a bit of the Amazon life. Yeah, uh, again, another a beautiful culture deep in the Peruvian mm. Amazon. Um, I went to a town called Iquitos, which is like the gateway into the Amazon jungle, um, and it was flood season and the kids had no school to go to because, as you can see, everything was underwater and they were just kind of cruising around in these canoes and, oh, man, that was one of the most incredible trips I've ever been on in my life. And, oh, you know, amazing. you've got howler monkeys going off in the background anacondas piranhas and then you've got this city this little city that's marooned in the middle of the jungle um and just these kids and it was just incredible it was just absolutely mind-blowing being in the middle of nowhere yeah awesome um now we go, we'll, we'll do um, Arnhem Land as well because um, this is something so I think is pretty important, pretty important yeah. for you to show. So, sorry that I'm going through everything so quickly, but let's see. No, okay. Um, I guess we can just now, kind of. Arnhem, Arnhem Land, if you want to quickly explain a little bit about Arnhem Land and why you felt, I guess, gravitation towards doing um, maybe a little bit of awareness or, or, or photo series here, what was, what was the pull here? So I went, sorry, you go? No, go on. So I went to, I went to Arnhem Land as part of a, a joint um, photo shoot for Canon and Getty. And I went to a place called Gove, um, which is in the northeastern corner um, of Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory, so up the top of Australia. And it's just, you know, incredibly rich. Um, it has incredibly rich Aboriginal um, culture and it's home yep. of the didgeridoo. Um, and it's oh. just this wild, like, untamed tropical paradise. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's in one of the world's most isolated towns. And it was just really beautiful and incredible to be welcomed into um, society and, and be able to go around and, and work with all of these incredible people and learn, you know, learn just, just in, just, you know, it's the, the indigenous culture. It's the oldest culture in the entire world. Like it's like 65,000 yeah. years old. Like we have that here on our soil. Oh, that, that picture there again, amazing. Um, Billy um, is the little boy on the left and then yep. Willie is the little boy on the right. And those are clapping sticks that the boys were holding. And Willie, he just picked it up and started kind of chewing it. And it looks like they're, they're jamming together yeah, you know, yeah. as equals, like equals friends, um, which is, you know, what we all are. And I just feel very passionate about that. And I feel like, um, there's a lot that happens up in Arnhem Land that we don't hear about, like the suicide yeah. rate, rate of teenagers is, is incredibly high. Um, the, the culture, like the Indigenous culture, it's something that, you know, isn't really practised at schools or encouraged or taught at schools. And um, there was a, a recent documentary, or not a recent one, but one that I saw, it's called In My Blood It Runs and it, it concentrates, it focuses on a, it's a film about um, some of the kids up in um, these Indigenous um, societies where they can't learn what what is in their blood and where they came mm. from and they, you know, mm. they get really depressed and it, it's just, yeah, there's just a lot up there that I felt very passionate about that I would love to kind yeah. of go back and, and teach people more about. But um. Yeah, it was it was amazing to be able to be welcomed into, you know, I guess the homeland of of Australia with with yeah, its people. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I, I think that's important, obviously, within yourself as well as you described earlier, connecting with land, connecting yeah. with yourself. But you know, if you if you if you don't find a sense of who you are, then I guess living it is is a pretty tough thing. Exactly. Yeah. Very beautiful. Um, we'll go through. We've got some photos of India as well. Next. Oh uh, yeah, these are just some of my. Um, the next one is as a tent. So I, I slept oh, in that tent, and this is in in Ladakh, in mm -hmm. Leh, Ladakh. It's like where the Dalai Lama lives, like up wow. far, far north in India. Um, 
and I traveled. Is this, bit, is this bit, uh, a bit of a spiritual trip of yours? Um, probably. I, hmm. I think I just wanted to go into the Himalayas on the back of, I was riding a Royal Enfield. Um, ah, sick. And just the whole trip, the whole, I think this was more of an adventure kind of, mm. um, you know, going into um, acclimatizing to altitude as well. Like one of my first trips being really high up mm. and it I think this is more like more of an adventure, you know, where's the road going to take me type thing. And this is where I ended up in that yellow tent, on the uh-huh. water of, yeah, of China. It was incredible. So, awesome. yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so, and these are some of my lion portraits. Beautiful. Um, so these lions aren't being hunted. These are happy lions in a happy conservation, yep. um, <laughs> happy uh-huh. conservation place um, called GG Conservation, and they're in South Africa, um, outside of Johannesburg, and they have I think like forty or fifty lions, and they're all just purebred, beautiful kings essentially, mm. and. It's got to photograph them. Big Beautiful. animals. I love the little love heart. And what, like, and what and what sort of what sort of gear would we be using for something like this to take? That photos? was they were they were all shot on the macro hundred mil macro. Hundred mil macro. Cool. Interesting. Um, yeah. We'll do the last um, last of the images and video here. So we we'll probably still show the video. We'll just show. This image here. Now, this is a shipwreck. Where is this shipwreck, Julia? Um, that's in the Bahamas. So, um, yeah, in NASA, in the Bahamas. And, wow. yeah, that's my friend Andre Musgrove. Um, him and I, I went to the Bahamas and he took me around and he actually filmed um, Shark Attack, the short film I made for Canon um, a couple of years ago. And, yeah, that was one of the shipwrecks we went to. I love shipwrecks. Shipwrecks, big fan. Obviously, yeah. how, how far down is this? This is about, what, 15 metres or so? Yeah, probably 15 to 17. Yeah, 15 to yep. 17. Cool. I'm, I'm going to play a video here um, as well. So let me pop pop this oh. one on just really quickly. So this is a GoPro one, a bit of a footage of you going down. Yeah, I just thought this is just something I could um... – that's this. So that's that shipwreck that we just had a look at. The photograph was taken of this shipwreck that I'm kind of, and then I'm, yeah, going in. That's my Nordicam housing. And then I've got my R5. I think I had an R5 at this point. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, penetrating the shipwreck, going in on one breath. Um, always kind of and how, looking around. And how long have you got down here on this, for, for this experience, Julie? Um, I was probably down for like a minute and a half, maybe a minute, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but you can see like the size, like the, the magnitude of this wreck is just, it's huge. And the, the water is so clear and there's just so much to see and it's just magnificent. You know, you just, I'm just constantly mind blown by by what's in front of me sometimes and okay. yeah just kind of sitting here on the bow taking it all in <laughs> um, but yeah why wouldn't you want oh, to explore great. and free dive exactly awesome yeah. oh, that's uh, thank you for sharing those images really beautiful that's okay i'm just gonna pop that i think we're back to the screen stop sharing there we go now i guess we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up now um but just Touching on what, what I guess is in store for the future of, of you, Julia. What have you got um, in the works? Have you, obviously, you've got quite a, a few things that haven't been released yet that you might not be able to talk about. But if there's anything that you can talk about, yeah. Um, well, I have a documentary series that is going to be coming out soon. Um, like I had mentioned before, we're just finalising a few more um, details before that. I can kind of, you know, talk about that, which I'm really mm. excited about. Um, and that was, you know, that's years of work. So it would be really exciting when I can share with everyone what, what's been happening with that. And I am going to probably definitely be working with um, change or charge battery. Okay. I guess I'll keep talking. Um <laughs> 
I am going to be working with Discovery again, I'm, I hope, um, and making some more shark films and, you know, just continue to work with conservationists. Um, hopefully I'll do a season two, three, four, five, six, seven of my series and, yeah, just keep doing what I'm doing really, which would be amazing. And, of course, working on Yachi, um, which is the – the um, van business I co-founded with my beautiful partner, Josh. So, yeah, that's what I'll be doing. And, yep, we are still live and Jax has disappeared. Um, I might answer some questions. So someone has asked me, did you always have Chris Shepard? Uh, did you always have a similar calling or did it change through the years? Um, I always had this calling um, since I was, since I can remember. Um, so I have to jump, I always... out and jump back in. Um, yeah, I always wanted to work with animals since I was a kid. I always wanted to be outdoors. Um, and yeah, that calling kind of always stayed the same. Hi, Jax. You're back I'm again. Back. I'm back. You did such a great just, job. I can still hear you. I was just answering some questions on the side because you disappeared. I so I was like, <laughs> um, okay. The cast really kicked in. I loved it. I, <laughs> I kind of looked at my phone and went, all right, they haven't called me. I don't know. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> okay. um, just quickly, last question before we go, Julia. Um, and it's yeah. it's a, been a bit of a popular question. How does one make a career out of conservation photography? Like how, how does someone do what you do um, and, and and get to experience all, all that life presents with photos and, and, and things like that? How, how do you make a career out of it as such? Well, I think I started, I just kept going. Like, I, mm. like having access behind the scenes of, of endangered species conservation and working with vets and working with mm. professionals and scientists, it's something that I started doing or trying to do um, probably like 10 to 12 years ago. And through my persistence of continuing to 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 approach conservationists and scientists mm. and experts in the field who work with animals and just through continuing to do that it, it opened a lot of doors but those doors were open because I started to walk down that path a long time ago and god sometimes you just want to give up sometimes mm. like when I in the early days when I started going to Africa to in 2014 to to start working on my series and to start you know building my identity in the field um, behind the scenes of, of conservation as a professional photographer and filmmaker, I just honestly, more doors closed on me than they opened. Like I, I, I wanted to, like, I, I came so close to giving up like mm. a couple of times and mm. somehow through, through the persistence, I don't know, I guess someone or something heard me and I just, I would always kind of get in or, or just I just didn't give up, even though I nearly yeah. did. I didn't, you know, and yeah. I think that's a big part of it is like firstly, don't give up. Um, you've got to keep going. And secondly, I think a big part of 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 my of what what drives me or how I keep going forward is that I don't ever think to myself I can't do something like mm. I never think I can't I always think I choose so I choose to do this and I choose to go here and I choose to try and I've and it all comes down to that personal choice that I've made so whenever I think about giving up I I, I just remind myself what I, I I chose to kind of be here and I chose to be persistent so in a way like I kind of re-collaborated or re, you know, mm. re-collaborated re -collaborated the thought process of what giving up and can and can't and a whole bunch of stuff. But um, I feel like I'm blabbing now because I've been talking for a long time and I'm <laughs> feeling a little bit tired and I'm not getting my words out, but just right. don't, don't give up. Um, just, just don't, just don't give up. And 
even when I did all my filming stuff, like I had a job on the side, you know, I had a family photography business for, for six years mm. and I was killing it like in the end, like I was making such good money and, um, but I started, you know, charging shoots. I was charging like $200 for an hour and a half photo shoot with unlimited photos for families. And then through like a long period of time, I upped those prices and then I was able to pay for um, going on my trips to Africa and the Amazon and India. Mm. And I had kind of like always a background side hustle that I was doing on the side that still meant I could shoot, but it wasn't a hundred percent what I wanted to do, but I still loved it. And then through that, I guess I, it, it just kept paying and paying and paying and paying to the point where I didn't need to do the family photography because I mm. had started to create that other side or that the filming side of things so um yeah you've got to like you know you've got to be prepared to work your ass off and not make excuses and um yeah just choose to do it like make that choice and then you can do anything that you put your mind to i love it yeah and i (laughs) i guess that just that, that shows that you know you haven't been an overnight success this is years of dedication and hard work and and finding what you want to do and and that doesn't happen at 20 sometimes doesn't happen at 30 you know so I think that's really important well I'm I'm like I'm 37 at the end of the month and it's I feel like I'm just kind of starting really um to fall in things to fall into where I want them to to kind of where I always dreamed they'd be and but it's not even a kind of things happening overnight. Um, throughout the process of evolving your career, you're also evolving yourself. You're learning about yourself and you're learning about what makes you happy and are you doing things because you think you have to or are you doing things because you want to or, mm. you know, there's so many questions and, and um challenges and you know you you constantly get tested and your path does change and it's you've got to kind of be open to that too because sometimes you know maybe you wake up one day and go you know what I've worked for so hard for so long but I don't want to do this anymore I want to change directions and even making that decision or going down that path it takes a lot of guts and you've got to be you know you just got to be brave and and really kind of try and connect with your with who you are and what makes you mm. you, um, and then a, um, yeah, that's a great answer, Julia. Um, Julia, it's been, an absolute, no, <laughs> um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, keep doing yeah. what you're doing. We can't wait to see what you do next, and I'm sure it'll be epic yeah. in whatever you do. Um, Thank you. And and yeah, thanks for joining us. It's been a, a real treat. Thank you for having me. It's been so nice to chat. I hope I didn't talk too (laughs) (laughs) fast. No, definitely not. Now, stay stay tuned uh, for next week, guys, because we'll have another awesome sports photography uh, on the couch session, and it will be Phil Hilliard on the August the 9th. Um, Just remember to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon as well, uh, and stay tuned for what we've got up. But Phil Hilliard, we're just going to play a little clip about what Phil does um, and his amazing imagery. Thank you.